The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode number 32. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Make it so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Don Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. Today we're discussing the Discovery Season 2 premiere, Brother. Joining me today yeah, on... We've got, we've got oh, new brother. Star Trek to talk about. Yes, oh brother. <laughs> oh, brother. In fact, we could maybe call it, oh brother, where art thou? <laughs> I was just going to make that joke, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and joining me today on the panel, as you've heard, are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? So, uh, folks, remember to like the SQPN Facebook page, retweet us on Twitter at SQPN, leave us comments on the show on SQPN, on Facebook, on Twitter, subscribe in iTunes if you can, Google Play, Stitcher, tune in your favorite podcast app or on YouTube where you should hit the bell to get notifications of new episodes, uh, write reviews of the podcast in iTunes and other podcast directories, and above all, share the podcast with your friends. Uh, any other Trekkies out there, you know, who are interested in finding out more about Star Trek, having interesting discussions, and being part of a community of listeners. We have a great community, and we are very happy to uh, to, to welcome new members to that community. Yeah. I want to just take... We, we, we also have something to offer that a lot of podcasts uh, don't. Um, you have a lot of podcasts uh, on Star Trek right now, and especially Star Trek Discovery, that tend to either be way negative <laughs> or way positive right where you really don't have a critical appraisal there's a lot of the fandom mm -hmm. of the fan community right now that's very polarized and there are a lot of channels and this includes youtube channels where um as father Corey was saying uh before we started recording for some channels star trek discovery can do no right yes and yep. then you have kind of a reaction to that where it can do no wrong and mm -hmm. and we're really pretty balanced objective we're gonna we're we're not into those wars yep. and we're offering something that's more in line with the traditional fandom take on this right we are yep. we are first and foremost star trek fans um and we want to approach it as a star trek fan and let it let it stand on its own two feet uh, uh for what it is and, and uh so i think you'll find so us so we're going to talk about the good and the bad yeah yeah, yep. you'll find a nuanced discussion. Uh, before we get into that discussion, I do want to uh, mention uh, another podcast that folks might be interested in. Uh, listeners to The Secrets of Star Trek might be interested in, in a new podcast called The Secrets of Technology, uh, where one yes. of the, the panelists is uh, Father Corey, uh, who joins me on, on that yep. uh, as well. And uh, we, we talk about tech news uh, from a particular perspective. Uh, and like, like Jimmy was saying about this podcast, we try to find a balance. Uh, we're not pundits. We're not journal, you know, tech journalists. Mm -hmm. uh, we're tech users. We're interested in in, in technology from that standpoint, and we're going to give you our honest take. And we're going to talk about it from the point of view of people who have to buy the gadgets with our own cash. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have to use it in our everyday lives, doing things that aren't journalism, etc. Exactly. So uh, we it, it, we hope you uh, check it out. It's at sqpn.com slash technology in in both cases we're not examples and this is true of starquest across the board but we're not examples of what's sometimes called access media right access mm -hmm. media is people who in exchange for access to things give positive reviews correct M most definitely you know, and our focus in Secrets of Technology isn't about having the latest, greatest gadget that can do the latest, greatest things for the next month until the next latest, greatest gadget comes out. You know, we want to talk more about how does this technology affect our daily lives? What are the moral issues of this technology? Yep. Of course, we are going to approach it from that perspective as well. Yeah. So check it out, sqpn.com slash technology. 
So let's talk about this episode, a highly anticipated uh, discussion of the new season of Star Trek Discovery. And uh, right off the bat, I, I, I've got to, you know, just kind of give my overview a bit of the of how this began uh, without, you know, kind of spoiling uh, our discussion. But I really feel like this episode answered a lot of or some of the of the complaints or even just the misgivings that some of us had about last year, which is that was a very dark season. That first season was mm -hmm. dark. Um, it was, uh, it was um, not cynical, but it was hard to um, uh, have a little, a lot of hope. There was a lot of negative, a lot of, uh, you know, Burnham was a traitor and was, you know, disliked our main, mm -hmm. our, our focus point character was a, was, was someone on the, on the downside. Uh, you know, had machinations against her. You had traitors in the midst and all this. It was a very dark season. And I think that might right. be part of the reason why people complained. This one I had did. a different feel to begin. It it did. It also tied up a bunch of stuff that fans had, some fans had objected to in the previous season. Like, why do the uniforms look so different if we're only slightly before the time right. of the original series? And here yeah. they, they, they explain that. they When Captain Pike shows up with his officers it's like oh we've got these you may have this cool experimental starship but we've got spiffy new uniforms right, right. Um, exactly and and so you know it did little things like that also another big question was if spock had this mystery sister um why didn't he ever mention her and i that never bothered me also right. frankly mm -hmm. the darkness of discovery never bothered me um, of this first season, I, I took it as just kind of a, an extension of what we'd already seen in Deep Space Nine, but with a more 21st century Battlestar Galactica type vibe mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I didn't bother me, although it uh, it uh, it does feel it did bother some. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and it, it this one definitely does feel lighter in in tone, most definitely. Yeah, I, I've seen comments online. I kind of agree with it. Is it does feel more Star Trekky? Yes. That's, you know, it does feel true. more of the kind of the, the original vision for Star Trek. It's still not, you know, bright and pretty and everything, but it is better. not with not with someone planning to wipe out all life in the galaxy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not dark at all. <laughs> yeah, but, but but they did have um, that moment right at the end of the episode where uh, Captain Pike turns to Michael Burnham and says, um, you know, we're going to have so wherever our journey takes us, we're going to have some fun along the way and, you yeah. know, make some noise. And so that was a direct message to the fan that was right. pounding on the fourth wall yeah. saying, expect this season to have more fun in it. Yes. Well, that's and that, and that might be a good way to uh, transition over to talking about the the cast, you know, the crew of the of the new new season. And I really like Pike in this. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I did. I have to say, like the first impression of Anson Mount as Pike. I really got like a very conscious Jeffrey Hunter vibe. Not that he was mm -hmm. trying to pretend to be Jeffrey Hunter, who played Captain Pike in the first pilot of uh, the Cage. Uh, yes, the Cage. The, yeah. the and by the way, this this is set like two, three years after the Cage. So the Cage has happened in Pike's personal history by this point. He's already had his romantic attachment to Vina and left Talos for. Right. Right. Yes, mm -hmm. and and has overcome that uh, the darkness that he had had been dealing with in that in that episode uh mm -hmm. apparently it and and i did but i got that that sense from him and i i i i like pike's uh his um his approach it's different it's different from Lorca. it's different from uh a lot of others it feels more kirkish i have yeah. to say mm -hmm. we have another pounding on the fourth wall where he tells the crew and thus the audience i am not Lorca." in those words <laughs> yeah <laughs> right, exactly right. very very clear so that so uh, so we have his, he's probably the biggest new character. Um, there are a couple others to show up uh, with some very briefly. One, one of whom is a jerk and therefore dies immediately. <laughs> yes, I have to say that was that was a, that was a bit on the nose. That one uh, yep. he was he was an arrogant, condescending jerk and died in the middle of being arrogant and condescending. Um, but he wasn't wearing a red shirt, so they, they subverted that trope. Uh, yes. They totally did. Also, there's preceding that, there's a line with the red-shirted officer who's an engineer with apparently orthodontic problems because she's wearing this weird, weird head thing gear. on her head, <laughs> apparently to adjust her teeth. Um, mm -hmm. And and the, the uh, Captain Pike turns to her when they're about to go on the ridiculously dangerous uh, action drama-inducing mission. 
Um, he turns to her and says, "Get your red shirt into a one into an EV suit." Right, right. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, um, I have more to say and about that's, that. But, that's that's yeah. the first time we've had the phrase "red shirt" actually appear in Star Trek. So right. that was very deliberate, setting up expectations. Ooh, is she going to die? Nope, it's the guy exactly. in the blue shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, he's the science officer. He can't. There's too many science officers now. The this, between uh, Burnham and Spock, we just the, he's the, he's the third wheel, uh, literally. Yeah. Uh, so the the episode begins with a voiceover: "Space, the final frontier." From Burnham, um, it but changed a little bit from there. Above us, around us, within us, we've always looked to the stars to discover who we are. And then she tells this uh, folk tale from a thousand years, a uh, thousand centuries ago in Africa a girl who casts the Milky Way into the heavens, etc. cetera, um, which I think is going to eventually come to be part of the mythology of this season, the, uh, the, arc, the overarching story. Mm -hmm. uh, I just have to assume that. Um, yeah, and it couldn't really be from, ten, from a thousand centuries ago. That would be 10,000 years, and oral tradition does not survive that long. Right, right. And writing does not go back that far. That's true. Uh, then we have this flashback to when Burnham came to Sarek and Amanda's house. Uh, as a, to recall, she was orphaned in a Klingon attack on her parents' uh, colony, on her family's the colony where her family was, and she was orphaned. And uh, they were discovered by Vulcans who brought the, the, these children to Vulcan, and she was uh, adopted by Amanda and Sarek. And we have this. Uh, very interesting uh, the way they, they, they eventually it, you know we get the extended uh, flashback throughout the episode of how Spock didn't accept the presence of uh, Michael Burnham in the home. Yeah, and this is one of the things that I I I don't I I don't, I, I don't think everybody needs to have this reaction, but I do understand this reaction that really set off some elements of fandom because um, Spock has a very negative reaction to mm. Michael. Um, he initially ignores her and his parents playing some kind of video game on his iPad like any five-year-old. <laughs> and and he does appear to be about five years old in this, you yeah. know, uh, four or five. Um, and then when, uh, when Sarek and Amanda bring Michael in and say, she's going to be staying with us, I expect you to be friends. Sarek specifically says, I expect you to be friends. Um, he then, uh, Spock, reaches above the iPad and conjures out of it a huge Vulcan dragon, otherwise known as a Lamatya, mm -hmm. that, um, mm -hmm. that then menaces Michael. So this is, he's being a real emotional jerk right from the beginning. And then when she extends her hand to shake his hand, he slams the door on her. <laughs> so this is Spock being a real emotional jerk. And for a lot of people, I mean, Spock is a beloved character. And mm -hmm. uh, in the first five minutes of the show, have Spock be such a jerk to Michael is could be viewed by many people as a betrayal of his character. Now, if you know the the deeper mythology of the show, though, um, mm -hmm. if you, especially if you know the animated series, this is tying into an episode called Yesteryear, where we learned about Spock's childhood. In fact, where he, he faced a Lamatya. Um, so that's what that's drawing on. But also we learned in that episode that there is a rite of passage that Vulcans a little bit older than Spock at this point have to go through called the Kazwan, which is, they, they're, they basically choose the Vulcan path. And in yesteryear, mm. Spock is shown as being an emotional child who has not yet definitively chosen the Vulcan path and is even scared about going on the Kazwan ordeal. And so um, so this actually ties in to de the right. deeper mythology of the show. But it, I can understand why some fans would say, our beloved Spock would never behave like this much of an emotional jerk. Right. But he could, if you know the deeper stuff. And also, uh, in terms of writing, you have to start somewhere before you go somewhere. Other, mm -hmm. if, if everybody is as mature as they and fully formed as they will ever be, 
then you have no right. character development over time. So you can't expect, just for dramatic purposes, an extremely young Spock to be the mature, polished Spock we know and that is a beloved character. Right. right. He's five. And even in He's... even in Star Trek, they've established that Vulcan children have, like you said, are have no, are cool. not right. Well, they're emotional. In fact, Vulcans mm -hmm. are emotional. They just control their emotions. Yeah. Exactly. Um, they're they're so emotional that they had to adopt the logic code to keep from killing yeah. themselves off as a species. They're actually more right. emotional than we are. Right. Uh, in in fact, I, one of the things I like about the portrayal of Sarek in this, uh, the, the actor who plays Sarek is he, he he does the as as well as um the other mark best leonard what's that mark leonard the other actor to play sarek yes as well as um uh tuvok and other people who played mm -hmm. vulcans uh over extended period they're not emotionless and that's a mistake i think that too that some of the uh minor right. uh, people who've done one-off vulcan characters are tried to do uh, most vulcans are not emotionless and so Sarek shows emotion, but it's very subtle. It's so, very suppressed and, and you know, uh, uh, very mild. Um, well, and, and I wonder if that is where some of the complaints about how Spock is being portrayed, at least again, as a child, they miss that, that, you know, even when as adult Spock, he oh, yeah. showed a sense of humor. He showed, mm -hmm. you know, upset, anger frustration you know he showed the, those emotions right even as he would deny them to, to mccoy he would still show those emotions right yeah. right it was uh, the post culinar which is there the, the some vulcans go through a uh, uh, a purging of emotions and that was in star trek the motion picture where we saw the most emotionless spock and of course that eventually mm -hmm. gets gets uh, left Undone. behind as well yeah yeah so in that movie, in that very movie, he he rejects that ideology ultimately. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm appreciating the, the portrayal of Vulcans in this in this one so far. Um, mm -hmm. So then we snap back to the present time of Discovery, um, where we had ended last season with Discovery, you know, after having the crew being awarded medals and uh, everything being wrapped up quite nicely at the end, um, encountering the Enterprise, uh, which you know all the fans mm -hmm. just loved. Uh, we are see our beloved enterprise and uh, a seemingly functional beloved enterprise. And <laughs> suddenly that's retconned. Yes. And now it's <laughs> offline and only on life support. Um, and it was apparently on this mission, th uh, this vital mission that requires Captain Pike and two of his top officers to leave the enterprise and take mm -hmm. temporary command of discovery uh, from Commander Saru, who was only acting captain. Um, and and sort of commandeering it at Starfleet's orders to investigate a phenomenon. Um, uh, we we get this whole moment of um, we, we all everyone expects Spock to be on Enterprise. We all know that Spock yeah. was on Enterprise with Pike, and so there's a sort of assumption throughout this episode that Spock was on Enterprise this whole time. Um, and Sarek assumed he was working to get Enterprise back online, which yeah. is the first officer would be an expected mm -hmm. duty in the absence of his captain, except actually number one would have been the first yes. officer at this time in all likelihood. And in fact, we will but, see an actress playing number one this season. Nice. We, we, you know, um, and yeah. actress, uh, Rebecca Romaine actually plays. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. So that should be interesting. But uh, yeah, Spock, but still Spock would have been working on board Enterprise as one of the office, regular officers. Um, so we don't actually get a reveal that he's not even actually ends up not being there until the end. Um, so then we, we go to the opening credits finally at this point. Um, and the credits are interesting. I, I don't, I don't want to skip over them because they've changed them slightly from last season. Uh, the, there's a lot mm -hmm. the same, but there's a few, some imagery in this that may hint at what we can expect. There's this, uh, this image, uh, a, a, a shadowy image of an, angel wings a creature with wings that's sort of a mm -hmm. human being with wings uh, almost um and then even at the end we have these these two space suited hands touching that's reminiscent of um the creation of adam in uh, the sistine in chapel the sistine chapel mm -hmm. yeah yep. so there's maybe something there, there has been a lot uh, talked about that there will be themes related to faith topics in this season of discovery um, and so that's one of the reasons why we're particularly interested in that. That's what, how, where yeah. we approach things from. 
And so, it's also another connection between this series and Deep Space Nine, which was the series that most went into the subject of religion mm -hmm. of Star Trek. Exactly, exactly. Um, yep. So uh, we we get to the um, back to the Enterprise, and now the uh, I'm sorry, back to the Discovery. The Freudian slip there, I won. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> but uh, we get back to Discovery after the credits, and Saru and Burnham are headed to the transporter room to welcome Pike aboard. And uh, they have this discussion about um, Burnham's fractious relationship with Spock, and Saru mentions his that he has a sister that he uh, is estranged yeah. from. Um, well, he right. says he says there's territory between us we can't cover, and what he's referring to there is the fact that his yeah. sister Serana is back on his home planet, uh, Kaminar. Yep, uh, mm -hmm. and he's not allowed to go back to Kaminar because of Prime Directive reasons, because they're a pre-warp yep. civilization, as we learned in the short trek, The Brightest Star. Exactly. Exactly. Um, in the trans uh, in the transporter room, I, I don't know if they they really kind of focused on this one uh, extra character, the transporter tech, w who's wearing a visor that looks out like Geordi's, with a yeah. weird a weird ball me metallic toupee as well. <laughs> and there's there's a lot more prosthetic stuff on actors this season. There was a lot last season. There's even more now. Personally, yeah, I'm not yeah. a fan. Yeah, they're they're going for this idea that. Um, I don't Transhumanism. know. Transhumanism. Yeah, yeah. Or th that the technology requires more integration into the technology by the person, or or maybe they're not human. Maybe they're aliens. Some of them, I, I'm pretty sure, are non human crew members, but still. Um, so, well, it, well, it's you have the whole issue, though, with the, the visor where, you know, next generation, when, George, when, uh, Dr. Crusher meets Jory LaForge. She's talking about this wonderful technology of the visor and all right. this, that, and the other thing. Like, it's a brand new thing. Well, and now they've retconned that. Well, it, well, it, it it does not necessarily the same thing. I mean, it could be something yeah. completely different. But of course, by you could be playing a VR game. Yeah, but by yeah, focusing exactly. on something that looks so much like the visor, they're making a conscious decision, which may yeah. confuse fans. So yeah. it's it's because they really close up on it. Yeah. So I thought it was a very odd choice to do that. So. I mean, who knows? Well, maybe that'll come up again, or maybe that was just they just were having fun Maybe with it. Could be. Uh, Pike beams aboard, takes command under sections, uh, you know, regulation something or other uh, that, you know. 17 that says, you know, yeah. if there's a dire emergency and no other officers available, et cetera, et cetera. And exigencies and of the plot require it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And uh, so th what we what we have is that there are six energy distortions spread over 30,000 light years. Uh, that are in synchronicity that cannot be scanned. Um, yeah. And, and we're kind of getting a sense that maybe like if you scan it, it damages the, the what, computer, the computer that's scanning it. And that's what happened to the enterprise. Somehow yeah. that's <laughs> kind of what they're suggesting. Either that or the enterprise just really had a kernel panic or something and needed to reboot. <laughs> yeah, they were they well they were, of death. they were communicating yeah. with Starfleet on Skype and that caused yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh we get the aforementioned discussion of the the uniforms, although we I do I noticed that um eventually Pike starts wearing the old uniform that people on uh, uh that Discovery uses as opposed yeah. to his new uniform. At the very end of the episode, and that's that's an indication that he is now settling in. He's doing that in his ready room in his final in Lorca's ready yep. room in his final scene. So he's settling into his role as the temporary ca captain of the inner of the Discovery. Yes. So he's yep. now adopting its uniform, right? Which apparently the uniform uh, regulation in Starfleet is not uniform. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and we've we've seen that before where they would start a uniform type in one franchise and then it would eventually get rolled out. Yes. Uh, right. But gradually. And I assume that's what we'll see here. I assume by the final season of Discovery, assume it keeps getting renewed. They'll all be wearing original series reminiscent uniforms. Right. That would be that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. And and I have to point out that the uniforms that they're wearing now are reminiscent of Star Trek Enterprise. I mean, that's yes. mm -hmm. that there's that continuity from then. So it's not completely out of uh, left field. Uh, I, I did enjoy Tilly's awkwardness about Pike. Uh, yeah. The, that whole scene where she's <laughs> she he needs to, like, do the uh, the handprint in order to transfer command. And 
it's just so cute his, and so his funny. Pinky is misaligned, and <laughs> she doesn't know how to tell him. And then she adjusts his hand, and he pretends like she's hurt him. Yeah, and oh, I broke and, the captain. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it clicked for me in that scene. What Tilly is? Tilly is not Tilly. Tilly is an anti Mary Sue. Yeah. Mm. Um. In case you don't know from Star Trek fandom, a Mary Sue is a character, uh, that is unbelievably ideal great at everything except maybe has a tragic flaw and everybody yeah. loves her and all that stuff right and tilly is like and super competent at everything tilly is not tilly is insecure like yep. crazy she's a blabbermouth and and <laughs> she's lovable but she's, she's not lovable. super competent but she's well, an and, anti Mary Sue. Yeah. And it's I, I think that's appropriate because I think there are plenty who will say that there is a very strong Mary Sue in this entire series <laughs> named in the Michael. person of Michael Burnham. <laughs> yeah. So right. Yeah, I mean in fact in some ways Tilly is the anti Wesley Crusher. Um mm -hmm. cuz yeah. everybody hated Wesley and he was super confident. Everybody and, loves Tilly and she's not yeah. very confident. And, and Wesley is also cited as an example of a, a Mary Sue or in some cases, a Gary Stu. <laughs> Gary Stu. <laughs> he was the boy named Sue. Uh, yeah. The uh, they also address. So they address Lee. We mentioned the Lorca in the room, which is uh, the, mm -hmm. you know, that he, he, Pike comes right out and says, I'm not Lorca. Um, by, by, by the way, a quick note before we have also have a scene where we finally get to see a Saurian on this show um linus oh yes the, the the character who sneezes on the oh yeah unsympathetic science officer yes um and linus is uh a saurian which is means his people make the famous saurian brandy yes yes that's oh that's a good maybe, point maybe he needed a hot toddy made with that that saurian <laughs> yeah. brandy there you go yeah <laughs> Well, it's going also, around. <laughs> the, the 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 writer and linguist in it loves me that um when uh when they're talking about the uh, the fact that the computers go haywire when you try to scan one of the red bursts, um, mm -hmm. Burnham says, like a compass at the North Pole, it just keeps spinning. Yeah. And um, the issue comes up, of, is that a metaphor? And uh, like Pike says, good metaphor. And she says, actually, it's a simile. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. yes, there is a difference. A <laughs> metaphor is when you describe one thing as another, like if you say Richard is a lion, yes. that's a metaphor. Yep. A simile is when you compare. So if you say Richard is like a lion, yeah. that's a simile. <laughs> Grammar pedants unite. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, we also get an explanation for, the, uh, for why we're not going to be jumping around with the spore drive all the time uh, now. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is apparently inactive until they work the bugs out. Uh, no pun intended. Um, yeah. And Stamets you says mean the bugs like needing needing a human being hooked up to it. That <laughs> yeah. kind of bug. Yeah, and draining them like a battery. Uh, and Stamets says he's leaving to teach at the Vulcan Science Academy after this last little mission, which will take the whole season. Um, yeah. uh, he's leaving Discovery because of Hugh's death, his his uh, his uh, boyfriend, and. Uh, Stamets has changed personality dramatically, like yeah. 180 degrees. He was a he was a jerk before his experience with the spore drive uh, yep. sickness, I guess you could call it. And now he's he's like super nice guy. And and it, it, except for off the whole base thing, on it. What's yeah, that? Except for the whole thing about about Tilly, repeat after me. <laughs> yeah. I will speak less. <laughs> but even then, he kind of does it a nice way. He does it nicely, yeah. though. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I suspect that may be a character moment they're going to build on, because that may be part of Tilly's maturation as a character. We mm. may notice her speaking, saying fewer things yes. in well, the future. And I hope so, because, you know, they keep making this, oh, she's going to be a great captain. You know, Steemitz says that. And it's like, you know. Not the way the character is right now. <laughs> right. She would be yeah. a wreck if she was a captain right now. Right. But yeah. that's that's we like we said that characters have to begin somewhere. Um, so we cut to uh, Burnham in her quarters reading Alice in Wonderland and then remembering Amanda, uh, her, her uh, foster mother, reading it to her and then Spock com coming into the room. Um, and so yeah, uh, nice, Alice nice, really tender bit of earth bonding there yes. between Michael and Amanda mm -hmm. as both women from the planet Earth on Vulcan. Yes. And, and I'm wondering if uh, in Through the Looking Glass is, might be a bit of a metaphor for this season as well. Uh, 
maybe not mm-hmm. yeah. going to the mirror universe again, but maybe something having to do with um, what's going on with these red bursts and spa. Uh, so um, Sarek then shows up and reveals to Burnham that one of the reasons he took in uh, Burnham as a child was he wanted Spock to learn empathy from her. Um, and, and this is a really interesting moment to, where... To work with humans. To be able to work mm-hmm. with humans, right. And there's this interesting uh, sort of explanation, like, well, why wouldn't Amanda... We learn from Amanda, which is the sort of thing I would have asked, like, well, why would you mm-hmm. need Burnham? And he says he wouldn't have learned it from her because Spock has great reverence for her as his mother, and that tends to fill up the room. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and prevent you know other. I thought that was a very interesting insight about motherhood and uh, the role mother a mother plays in yeah. their child's uh, life uh, experience. I thought that was yeah. a very interesting insight. Yeah, children do not see their parents the way that the their parents' peers do, and right. there are things a child can learn from parents, but then there are things child children need to learn from peers. One of them and- is accent. Yeah. Children pick yeah. up children pick up their accents from their peers, not from their parents. Right, mm-hmm. you can see that in my house. Uh, the uh, in, in fact, it's 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 one of those reasons why you know, you know, if children who are only children uh, need to have that exposure to other kids their age, uh, and why right. having siblings can be a great benefit to their uh, their, their their maturing process, uh, their development process. Um, uh, you could see that I see it in my own kids that l- where they learn lessons from each other that they don't learn from my wife and I telling them to uh, mm-hmm. in, in some ways. Yep. By the way, in this scene, uh, Sarek says to Michael uh, or it proposes to Michael that Spock, uh, despite his wishes, wasn't able to accept her as a sister. And Michael then says something very mysterious, which is that he did accept her for a time yeah and then mm-hmm. she doesn't elaborate on that and um and sarek says well i can hear the missing notes and if you ever want to talk about it i'm available to talk about it yep. so it seems that michael and spock did have a time where they ended up bonding and for some reason it fell apart and we get another clue about that later in the re- in the in the episode where uh where um, Michael says, "I'm the reason," and yeah, she's, she's she, talking to Pike and you know asking about going over to the Enterprise to Spock's quarters and says, "You know, I'm the reason why there's this separation between us." Hmm. Right. She also says she's sure Spock has empathy, which presumably was displayed in his time accepting her, and that suggests that he was empathetic with her then in some way. Uh, she also, when she's doing a voiceover in his quarters, says, I can only pray I don't lose you again. And all of that seems to suggest whatever happened after Spock accepted her, Michael did something that caused him to shut her out mm-hmm. and that this was her fault, which is frankly the smart move they need to if they're going to play out this theme of Spock and um uh, uh, Spock and Michael have been estranged. It needs to be Michael's fault rather than Spock's. Otherwise, you're going right. to enrage fandom with right. beloved Spock was the jerk. Right, right. That's that's excellent point. And, uh, and it is a, it is a step to maybe redeeming uh, Michael's character from being the Mary Sue. Yes, mm-hmm. that you know she, here's more flaws. She isn't this perfect person. Well, I mean, to, and to to the credit, they also had her be a you know, sort of a traitor who bumbled her way into a war with the Klingons. So that yeah. sort of also mitigates the Mary she, Sue a little bit. She's not the Mary Sue that Ray is. Yes. No. <laughs> well, yeah. let's not get into that one. Nobody <laughs> is the Mary Sue that Ray is. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so one of the tra- these red bursts um, is, is available to be tracked. So they couldn't track the other ones, but one of them sort of... Um, is stationary and they're able to to lo- to to uh, pinpoint it to triangulate it and so the the discovery is traveling to to its location and then when it drops out of warp in that location that the signal is gone but they're in the middle of an asteroid field and you know where hmm. which you know the, these things are banging into the uh uh into the discovery and they and it's another super intense, amazingly rock dense asteroid field of the kind yes. that doesn't really exist in space mm. for yes. any lengthy period of time. Right. 
and we have to go on a drama juicing super dangerous mission yes. and expose little ships. I, hey, I wasn't this the 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 didn't we see this at the beginning of season one? Right, right. The, yeah, he, the travel through. I, yes. I don't know. I don't know why they're they're so they love these impossibly high speed chases through, like you mentioned, very dense asteroid fields or whatever, where I'm sorry, the human brain cannot process that quickly. Well, mm -hmm. they, they first they are, they're using the automated navigation, but they have to turn it off and use the force to get their yes. way. Through. Oh, wait, no, that's something else. I don't yeah, know how they did exactly. it. <laughs> uh, yeah. And of course, Michael Burnham is the one who has tested these pods and she pulled nine G's for 11 minutes in them. And Really? Well, so that where you would pass out with that. Yeah. And they're also experimental that they just happen to be on board Discovery. Yeah. Oh, um, I also love how Discovery has cameras that they can use to map this map this field. Was, it's like, oh wow, cameras. We didn't have actual, those on the Enterprise. Actual well, mechanical, mechanical cameras, not just sensors, but actual well, optical cameras. Let's let's talk about that for a second. Surely they would have sensors capable of reading a tattoo in the butt of a bug smashed on the bumper of that starship instead of having to rely on telescopic cameras and moving oh, yeah. in closer. So yeah. Oh, and, and I love how <laughs> Saru's eyes are apparently able to to fill in details that yeah. they can't just blow up larger on the screen so <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of hard, it. hard to go to the big view screen and do the you know the pinch and zoom you know it's well, really hard to do so remember the view screen is a is a uh, window with a heads-up display right so yeah. it's well, so it is they're all looking through it but even so but still like they would have sensors <laughs> like yeah. how, how else would you be able to travel at these with these super luminal speeds through space if you can't read things from far away uh, it's just yeah uh, that it, this is this is not <laughs> this is one of the places where this episode falls down as is the roll call that yeah. um that uh pike, does. That pike has the bridge crew do and yeah. they just whip around and say everybody's name without saying their position or or, rank. or their rank yeah and it's like i'm sorry nobody is going to remember that many names learned that quickly oh, so there's pike no will. point to this roll call <laughs> oh pike will pike is awesome <laughs> <laughs> I, I noticed you know, the, the, I, the one I, alien I, looking crew member by the way she still says mm -hmm. lieutenant ariel did you notice yeah. she still said yeah. her rank <laughs> well you know and what, you know, one complaint about that it's well the reason why they did this is because if you asked during season one, who half these people were, they literally never gave them a name. Right. Yeah. yeah half and these that, people, they were just on the bridge, no idea who they were. So at least they finally gave them names. That is, yeah. that is an improvement this season. But it's a cheesy one. The real way right. you give people names is not having a quick scene and then proceed mm -hmm. not to use the names anymore. The real way you do it is you say, Lieutenant Uhura, will you do this? Mr. Yes. Sulu, will you do that? You I think, use their names. I think we'll get I think that this is an indication we'll get more of that, that we're going to make this more of an ensemble. I hope. I mean, they That's... gave Detmer and uh the lady sitting next to her um more to do. They actually had mm -hmm. emotional interaction and th Yeah, they, that was I mean, fun. Yeah, I mean yeah. I I'm glad to see more of the crew getting involved in the in in this and and the bridge crew. Uh so that is a, that's a very positive. And I, and I did kind of get a kick out of how, you know, Pike was telling everybody do this, do this, do this and and Deborah, drive drive well. <laughs> yeah, drive well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of a lot of dialogue in here that was funny. Like when they're when they are going into the super dangerous asteroid field Saru's ganglia stands up and that. another yeah. another crew member sees it and starts to freak out and Saru looks at him and says really are you surprised <laughs> well, yeah. again that's, that's a, a little bit of fourth wall break in there I think mm -hmm. you know it's just a little bit of a, a but it's it's a um it like I wrote the same note there's a lot more lighthearted banter this mm -hmm. season and I I I didn't go check. I should have checked if the if they've changed anything in the writers' room a little bit, where they brought in new oh, people yeah. to give a little bit of a lighter tone to things. Um, right. So very mm -hmm. interesting. Um, they do say the, that there's the, a. Go ahead. The the best line I think emotionally in this sequence is after so after Connolly the unsympathetic guy dies. Yep. And Pike is severely damaged and has to get out of his uh, out of his pod. Um. And uh, Burnham is like saying, uh, I'm going to get you if Discovery has you. 
And then he says to the two women on the bridge, we have him, right, ladies? And they look at each other panicked and like, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was really <laughs> exactly. good. <laughs> so, uh, so two things, two notes that we have that uh, come up, but don't get really dealt with. And I think it's over the long term, we'll, we'll come back to this. Um, there is an atmosphere on this asteroid where there shouldn't be one. So it's unexplained. Yeah. And they, they mentioned that. Um, and the spores went crazy the closer they got to the asteroid, the mycelial spores yep. in the uh, spore drive. So, mm -hmm. and may, they mentioned it, the only other time that happened was when they had the tardigrade. Uh, so something connected to the yeah. spore network. Um, this may eventually be what happens to the spore drive and why they can't ever use it again uh, yeah. after this season. Perhaps. All, all, also later when they're getting off the asteroid, Burnham like grabs a piece of it for some reason, it is glowing or something and wants mm -hmm. to take it back to discovery. But when they beam out, it doesn't come with. Yeah. And, yep. and so Tilly explains it must not be made exclusively out of baryonic matter. Uh, baryonic matter is another way of saying normal matter. Right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, particles like protons and neutrons are baryons. And so baryonic matter is normal matter. And that's why Tilly then says, I think this is going to enable us, if we can get some of this asteroid on board, I think this will enable us to interact with dark matter. And to me, that's a mistake. Because dark matter is this new thing we're trying to explain now. We will probably have dark matter figured out by the 24th or 23rd century. Right. And so it's like, you're going to date yourselves, guys. Don't go there. Yeah. It's like, like the original series did with a few things like that. Uh, yeah. It dated itself. Um, one of the, uh, let's see what I was going to say um, about that. Yes. So Tilly had asked uh, her to grab a sample of the asteroid yep. because of the weird interaction with the spores. That was what that was there. So they, um, so they end up basically drawing a big, big old chunk bigger than the uh, shuttle bay into the shuttle bay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I did like how they, they, they dragged it in and pretty much smashed up the shuttle bay, but they got a big rock in there. Um, yep. They, they, I, I, also, I, did... I also like Tilly's reaction when they do. It's like, this is the power of math, people. <laughs> yes. And everyone applauds. And it's like, yes, classic. I mean, that has to become a classic nerd line. Yes. Yes. The power of math. I think it probably already is. But <laughs> <laughs> So um, uh, let's see. The uh, they when they so before this, they get down on the asteroid and they they have this, this crashed spaceship. Uh, it's a yeah. I think it's a medical frigate. Um, mm -hmm. that had gone missing during the Klingon War, and they mm -hmm. find uh, on board a this Commander Jet Reno, who, who was the ship's engineer, and several... Janet Reno? They found Janet Reno the, down there? Janet Reno was on board. That's where she went after mm -hmm. Waco, and uh, yeah. she <laughs> she's endeavoring to keep these uh, injured crew members from when they crashed 10 months ago, keep them alive using the power of engineering as opposed to the power of medicine, um, because... Mm -hmm. People bodies are just machines, right? We're just we're just machines, yeah. We're just meat <laughs> machines. I I do like when when they show up after the extensively long chase through the asteroid field, which is to me, it's like a car chase. Nothing interesting is going to happen to advance the plot until this is over, mm -hmm. right? And, and oh, and then they have to like instead of the instead of having a, a bomb that counts down to one second, they have Burnham and um and Pike getting within inches of the inexplicable stalagmites before <laughs> her pack kicks in and she's able to pull up. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And But then they meet uh, Janet Reno, and her first line is, thank Christ you're here. <laughs> right. And, and yeah. it's nice to have a reference to, I mean, you know, uh, that can be meant reverently or irreverently, but either way, um, it's, it is a, a bit of, the real world uh, being represented in uh, in Star Trek in a way that we haven't seen before. That's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe intentional, given the, the, the themes of faith that are going to be yeah. in this uh, season. Yeah. So well, uh, the only, the only thing I can think that. parallel is in one of the movies, Dr. McCoy says, sweet Jesus. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. My, my only complaint about it is they, they've definitely ramped up the... Uh, profanity a little bit even there, just kind of the mild cursing yeah yeah there's a couple yeah there's some cursing in it this is definitely streaming video uh level of of cursing uh in this it's not your your parents star trek um 
so the they they have to evacuate them from this ship because the uh, discovery's actions have pushed this um asteroid toward a neutron star where it will crash within uh, five uh, hours if you were within yeah that makes no sense if you were within five hours of hitting a pulsar you would already be destroyed i mean that's just yeah it, it, that doesn't it, make any sense that makes no sense the pulsar should uh, it should have destroyed them if they're that close unless they're unless this asteroid field is traveling towards the pulsar at warp speed right <laughs> which they i can't remember how fast they said it was but it wasn't that fast it, not it by was. any stretch well, they'd be dead of the radiation from the pulsar, and you know already mm-hmm. given their the state of that starship without shields. Uh, so they they have to um, set up pattern enhancers, but they're not going to need them unless something goes wrong with the transporter on board this failed starship, which it will. Then, of course, they wink, check wink. check check off pattern enhancers. <laughs> yep. So um, Burnham gets a uh, everyone gets off except for Burnham. She gets a uh, knocked out of the transporter beam. Oh. Well, she jumps out of the transporter beam when there's a tr- trouble and doesn't get back in it, um, gets knocked out of the transporter room and has to um, escape as this is being destroyed. And she's lots in- of explodey stuff. Yeah, happens. And then, yes. then you've got the, the, the hero run where everything's exploding and stuff's falling around her and nearly crushing her, but not quite. And- but then she gets impaled on a red hot rock. Um, mm-hmm. And is in her leg and is yes, in her leg and is losing consciousness. And as she's losing consciousness, she sees this angel creature uh, through the fire and smoke or whatever, and mm-hmm. then it resolves into Pike, yeah. who beam back down running to come and get her. Um, yeah, we should also explain the for people who, for some reason, are listening but haven't seen this. Um, <laughs> the angel doesn't look like a classic angel like you'd mm. see in Christian art. It's right. kind of a humanoid. It's glowing. It's very indistinct, and it has these kind of skeletal wings where we see right. like sh- sh- spikes that well, bend and come out kind of like a wing. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's like they're illuminated from behind. It's a, it's yeah. an indistinct shadow uh, really. Um, yeah. So, and then the question is, is, did the strange signal intentionally call them to the asteroid to rescue the castaways? Was it a, was it, is there some third party, some uh, other force out there that wanted them to come and discover these people and save them? Um, that's an interesting mm-hmm. question uh, that doesn't get answered in this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there, we're we're uh, left with these questions. Another question that doesn't get answered is why would Saru on the Interpro- on the Discovery <laughs> drop the shields and uh, it, way before they're going to use the transporter? And right. allow an asteroid to nice knife slice the saucer section. Right. That was a little uh, that, too soon. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, drama. The existences yeah. of drama. Uh, so um, everything is better now. Uh, afterward, uh, Burnham's back on board. They've got the the giant rock a sample. Um, Burnham is healed quickly in sick bay, which was a nice uh, nice moment, including the interaction with the uh, the doctor. All Starfleet doctors are crotchety. That's just the way it is. Um, they, uh, they, they, there's a scene now where, uh, Burnham is in the Lorca's old ready room with Pike, uh, where Pike observes there are no chairs, which is, uh, which is nice. And she's like, uh, and Burnham says he, I guess he didn't want long meetings, which is like actually a, a real tactic that people use meetings without chairs. And I, I, need, I, I need to start doing that. I, I heartily endorse that. that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but Pike, you remember Lorca had this thing about fortune cookies and, and, yep. and it was very kind of an odd quirk. Um, and so uh, Pike finds a uh, a fortune on the floor, a lost you know strip of paper. Um, not every cage is a prison. Not every loss eternal, which is undoubtedly a a, a reference to the season. But I wonder, is it a a reference to the cage? Yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, the, the, I think the, the use of the word cage had to be a connection to that. Yeah, not every cage is a prison. Has to be a reference to the cage and yeah. the paradise that the Talosians want to give. Um, to want to give uh, yeah. to Pike mm-hmm. the loss could be in that case Vina or Vina or however they said her name because yeah. he will end up with her in the end. Um, it also made me wonder about its more immediate application to this season in terms of the cage. I don't know, but not every loss is eternal. I'm thinking Stamets's dead husband is going to come back. 
Yeah. I mean, we already saw him in this episode. I'm thinking they're going to mm-hmm. resurrect him somehow. Yeah. Either that or Stamets dies, in which case mm-hmm. they get to be reunited that way. Right. The, well, I mean, the way we saw Hugh was in a recording that Stamets was watching. Yeah. Um, well, I, there's, there's also could be the uh, connection with Sp- between Spock and Michael. Mm-hmm. That, that could, could also be, be a too. direct yep. reference to that, that, you know, that right now it's a loss, but it's not an eternal loss. Yeah. We have- by, by the way, Dom, th- that also brought to mind something I meant to mention earlier. You talked about Stamet's personality change and how he started out as a real jerk. And then for a while, he was like high on spores yep. and, and became really nice. But then he's not high on the spores now. But what he has had happen is he's lost somebody he cares about and he's grieving. And that kind of pain when you lose somebody can have a, a, an effect where it gives you a lot more empathy for other people. Right. Um, that's something people commented on after my wife died I, I in in talking to people. I mean, I, w- I think I've always been a pretty compassionate guy, but I've had people after talking with them say without me being around, he must have suffered tremendously in his life to be able to show that level of compassion. Mm. And and so that rings emotionally true here. Mm. Interesting. Uh, and just uh, just did a real quick check on IMDb. Uh, then Wilson Cruz is listed for 11 episodes of Discovery. This season, this, oh, total. Mm-hmm. Oh, total. So okay. that's all last season plus this episode. So he probably won't be coming back, at least not well, the way this is listed. IMDb is not always. I mean, they IMDb have used was it. the one. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, IMDb was the one that told us that uh, that Klingon guy was not a Kling- was was no. a different actor. Yeah. So uh, one True. of the things I think it could, might it could be I'm not going to say it is, but it could also be a reference to Lorca's death. That uh, you know that Lo- Lorca's mm-hmm. death may not be eternal, especially given that it was the mirror universe Lorca. So where's our universe's Lorca? Mm-hmm. Right. So there might be reference there as well. Uh, I, I think they did invite the actor back for this season, but he couldn't make it for scheduling reasons. So we may mm-hmm. see him in another season. Yes. Uh, we do get told that the reason we didn't see Enterprise last season during the war with the Klingons was that it was away on its five year mission and was was too right. far out. Couldn't have got back in time and was even they were thinking of it even as a fail safe, like sort of keep a, it safe. An out there. instrument of last resort. Right. Uh, so there's, there's so that. in other words, come in and like kill Kronos or something, just you know, nuke uh, the surface of the Klingon homeworld or something, right? Like a uh, like a, a doomsday weapon. Yeah. Um, the, the, we have a, this in this discussion between uh, Pike and uh, uh, Burnham. We, the, the, she says that Spock had a way of making logic. See- oh no, it's Pike says, I think it's mm-hmm. Pike had a way of making logic seem like the beginning of the picture not the end, which is an interesting uh, statement. I, I, I feel like mm-hmm. that's leading to something. Um, mm-hmm. And then and then he reveals that Spock isn't on the Enterprise at all. This whole time where we thought he was over there, yeah. he actually had taken a leave to pursue something, quote unquote, um, which will turn out to be these bread bursts, undoubtedly. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, so, so uh, Burnham gets permission to go over and visit Spock's quarters, which is an interesting mm-hmm. violation of his privacy. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, exactly. Well, Pike gives her permission to go over, but doesn't give her permission for the quarters. She just does that. That's true. Because this is the 23rd century and nobody would violate anyone's privacy. So nobody needs to lock their door. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah, the door's not locked or anything. She just hits the open button and it pops right open. So. <laughs> So and then we see inside his quarters of some familiar Vulcan things yeah. like the musical instruments. I like that they didn't simply recreate the quarters we saw later because this yeah. is mm-hmm. 10 years earlier. Nobody's room is going to look the same. Right. In fact, it looks well, they, a lot like the uh, quarters that we saw in the cage, that that sort of shape and feel to it. Uh, like we had mm-hmm. seen Pike's quarters. So it actually feels more like that. Mm-hmm. We, we do get to see Spock's Vulcan harp. Uh, yep. We get to see a chess set, a 3D yep. chess set, and we get to see the marriage bells thing. Yes. Um, <laughs> which Michael then rings a little bit. And uh, and that's nice because she is going to know, as Spock's sister, she's going to know that he is betrothed to T'Pau. And mm. she's going to know the significance of the of this marriage bells instrument from Omukhtan. And then we have this uh, Burnham accesses his Spock's personal log, his last log mm-hmm. entry, 
in which Spock talks about having been plagued by nightmares as a child, which his mother taught him to control by drawing, hence the drawing of mm-hmm. the Lamatya, the uh, mm-hmm. Vulcan dragon. Mm-hmm. Um, and then says the, the nightmares have returned, showing him the same vision and that Spock now understands their meaning. And so he encoded this vision within the audio file to be played mm-hmm. in the event of his death. So then Burnham activates that drawing tablet, his iPad when he was a kid, mm-hmm. um, which shows a, the map of the seven red bursts. And then she mm-hmm. realizes what Spock had seen, although that's not completely revealed to us. Um, so it's very interesting. Uh, yeah. And he's apparently he's taken leave to go in search of this. Yes. And she's afraid of losing him again. And Spock on in one search level, of. Yeah. <laughs> Spock in search of. Um, it is, on the one hand, in from a writing perspective, it's irresponsible. I mean, if you if you know, and we learn from the voiceover of the of the teaser at the end of the show that someone or something is trying is trying to wipe out all life in the galaxy, and if Spock thinks these things are that significant, why hasn't he reported it to the Federation? Right. Why has he gone off on right. his own? It doesn't make any sense for him to take on a mission of that import by himself. That unless is not he, logical. Unless he didn't know when he started on his mission. And that's possible. However, yeah. it is very Spock to do cowboy diplomacy in this way. <laughs> it's not like we haven't seen him undertake a personal mission without telling the Federation later before. Yeah, later before. Exactly. exactly. Um so a, a couple of things that I, I didn't mention as we went through. Uh, there is a nice moment when um, when we have that uniform moment where Pike says we've got the the, the, the lovely new uniforms. He had yeah. preceded that by saying, "I see where the Federation puts its pennies." Actually, the the uh, engineer said that. Engineer did, yeah. And uh, he says, "Do not covet thy neighbor's starship, Commander." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just a, a nice scriptural reference there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, and also Pike had the, a great line when they come out of warp and it's an asteroid instead of the red burst. He says, I was expecting a red thing. Where's my darn red thing? He said, yeah, <laughs> that was good. Only he doesn't say darn. Yeah, I, nope. I cleaned it up for our PG audience. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so any last thoughts about this episode? Any last thoughts about the beginning of this season that you want to mention? Uh, I'll start with you, Father Corey. Anything we didn't? Um, well, one thing when uh, Captain Pike first beamed over, you know, he says, well, this is uncomfortable, but as we learned in Mojave, of course, yes. being yeah. from, we know that from the, the cage, you know, so they had that, that reference from, as where he's, he's from. from Mojave, California, yep. which is a real um, town, although it's very yep. small in our time. It's very small and it's a desert, unlike in the cage where it became terraformed into a lush Yeah, apparently area. we don't care about the environment in the future. Oh, yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. And one, one thing that irritate, irritated me on this is apparently they have the technology now where objects can just grow spontaneously. So they yes. don't put on their suit. Their suit kind of morphs around them yes. when they have Iron the injection Man style. suit. <laughs> yeah, iron. Or when they put in that gravity simulator, it was like a little disc they put in the middle of the floor, and all of a sudden it do- it goes into like ten times the size. No, yeah, it just grows. Mm-hmm. It's like it's larger on the inside. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, they, apparently, uh, Starfleet has discovered TARDIS technology. Yes, uh, Jimmy. Anything uh, you want to finish up with? Uh, I wondered why Janet Reno had a laser beam capable of slicing through people's ankles in her entryway that she has to guide them around. This is just like nothing. It plays no role in the plot other than right. to stop the action for a moment. And she says, I, did, I, I don't have time for you to be decapitated. And it's like, OK, well, it wouldn't decapitate them. It would defoot them, the <laughs> level this thing is at. Well, they, um, they they did show that. Uh, sorry, uh, they did show that as Burnham's running out, you see the 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 that tube she's running through getting shredded, and I think mm-hmm. it wasn't a laser beam to cut off their feet; it was a sensor sensor beam. And then there was other oh. weapons that were shooting across. Okay, well, they totally didn't make that clear, right? And and I thought it was a flaw in the writing. Also, it probably was she, still a flaw in the writing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the, also the, also this is an uninhabited asteroid and she's got these drone guards. What does she need a self-destruct well, entryway for? She does say that she was expecting someone with a batleth. She was expecting Klingons. Oh, okay. I'll so, give him, I'll give him she that. She still thought the war was going on. So. Right. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. those Japanese watchers in after World War II. Yeah. 
<laughs> then then she wants to shake uh, Pike's hand, and she's got Tellarite blood all over her hands, and she says it's got it's rich in hemerythrin, which is a real thing, and she's right; it is found in certain kinds of oceanic life here on Earth. And I guess the implication is don't worry about getting bloodborne illnesses. The hemerythrin is going to kill them. But it's still kind of it's still icky. why are we <laughs> why are we even doing this? Um, there's a moment that makes no sense on the bridge where after Pike has gotten back from the asteroid, he turns to and they're going to grab the piece of the asteroid. Um, Pike says, my mission is ended. And he invites Saru to sit down and to. To to my mind, I'm wondering. Wait, so does uh, in the moment I'm going. Does that mean Pike is going to leave after this episode? That he's yeah. completed what he thought his mission in investigating this red thing was when they haven't mm-hmm. even found the red thing. It's just totally confusing. That was an um, unnecessary moment because because then later on he returns to to being in command of the discovery. Yep. Exactly. So it it didn't make any sense. Now allegedly there were a bunch of reshoots. In right. these early episodes, so some of this choppiness may be because of that. Okay, um, but it still doesn't make sense on a writing level. Uh, Pike says that a few months ago he sensed that something in Spock shifted before he went off on this mission, and it kind of reminded me of Spock's mission to find Viger in the motion <laughs> picture, right? Um, where he's going off to find this super powerful thing that he has somehow sensed in his mind. Um, I did like in the preview, we get to see that Spock has a beard and a full one. So the, like, like, that's got to be good. You know, anytime Spock <laughs> has a beard, it means things are good. So. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a goatee, so it's not evil Spock. He's not evil Spock. Yeah. That's right. Um, so uh, I do want to uh, mention, uh, I mean, we could talk a little bit about the, the, the teaser, but there's not a whole lot, except um, we know that Georgia is coming back. Uh, the, yep. all, mm-hmm. the Mirror Universe Georgia has apparently Part been... Re- section 31. Although Section 31 in this time period seems to be more well-known, sort of bandied about. And originally, it was so secret that no one had ever heard of it. Uh, and now it's he, suddenly something Pike knows about. Well, Pike is a pretty high-ranking captain, so maybe that's yeah, why. Maybe. Uh, I hope they don't make it Section 31 more pedestrian than it should be. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, uh, go, we, so anyway, we have some feedback, if we can go to that next. Um, oh, we got uh, right. a nice nice comment on our Short Treks episode that we just did um, on YouTube from Chaos Knot, uh, who says, uh, thank you for an encouraging and insightful discussion of Star Trek. I'm almost ashamed to be a Trekker with how to- toxic the fandom has become. I am confused. I thought we were supposed to celebrate infinite diversity in infinite combinations. So that harkens back to what we were talking about early on uh, in our discussion today, just um, how we try to have a more balanced discussion of things. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I appreciate you uh, mentioning that, Chaos Knot, and welcome, welcome aboard, Secrets of Star Trek. Uh, so that, that's great. And then um, we have a new listener, um, Diego, who has sent an email, and he says, uh, I watched the Star Trek movie today, exposing myself to Star Trek for the first time. And then, listen, and then listen to your episode 13 on being fans of Star Trek. Uh, I might be interested in, in learning more about the franchise. Do you have or can you make an episode on the in, introducing Star Trek to newbies? I like the episode, but for the most part, I didn't know what they were talking about. Hmm. Uh, Interesting thought. Yes, we actually yeah. mentioned the, uh, this idea of, of um, how do we introduce Star Trek to, to be like my kids are, are getting old enough mm-hmm. to watch it. So how, I was trying to figure out how to introduce it to them. But it is an idea. It's like as Star Trek is becoming more popular with more series. Um, how do you introduce people to it? What's the best way? Where do you start? Where do you begin? Yeah, because exactly. that's a, that's a huge question. Um, so uh, I, I, unless you guys have something you want to say now, we, it's something we we do plan to put on the schedule um, as a full discussion. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but it's it's it will be a good discussion when we get there. I would say, uh, just to tie Diego over, if he wants to jump into something, starting at the beginning of any of the series is is a, provides a good jumping on point. They all are designed, whether it's the original series or Next Gen or uh, Deep Space Nine or Voyager or Enterprise or now Discovery, the beginning of each, or the animated series, the beginning of each series is designed to give the audience a kind of sense of where we are in the future and what's happening and so forth. 
some of the series are more structured than others. The original series is is very not structured. It's just mm-hmm. individual episodes, but there's no overarching storyline. Um, a number of the series take a season or two before they start to really get good. Um, but uh, but those are some preliminary thoughts yeah. you might want to consider. And since Discovery is on the air right now, you might consider going back and watching the first season of Discovery. Uh, you can get it on Amazon, and it would catch mm-hmm. you up to what's happening in the franchise right now. Yeah, I would say that if you're going to jump in either the original series or Next Generation, Next Generation sort of starts the ball rolling for Deep Space Nine and Voyager. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, you could start with either of those, but you you really would get a more complete picture if you start with yeah. Next Gen. But like you said, Jimmy, Next Gen doesn't really get going good until the second season. It- as the third, um, I would, <laughs> and in fact, in fact, there's an it's it since there's no overarching story. I would even say if you're going to start with next gen, you could just skip the first two seasons, go straight to season three, and start seeing how mm-hmm. the series is when it's really kind of caught its wind. And you'll there will be a, for a few episodes, it'll be well, okay, so what's the Federation and what's a transporter? Yeah. But but that'll pass pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, and, and you, that by starting with the later season, you'll you'll miss out on the most cringeworthy st- and uh, premiere episode of Encounter with Farpoint. Encounter at Farpoint. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah, by um, the third season, Star Trek had already grown the beard. So, yep. Yeah, <laughs> grown to use a to use a uh, piece of TV slang for when something gets good. <laughs> so, um, which is Star Trek related. Yeah, that that yeah. is our uh, feedback for this week. So that's uh, good. Thank you for that, uh, Diego. Hope that help was helpful. But stay tuned for our. We're going to do a whole episode on on that question. So um, we before we finish, I'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek. Without their support, none of this would be possible. And today we want to thank um, S B, Barbara G. Kimberly W, Lynn F, and Suzanne S. Uh, through their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give, they make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Trek in all of the shows we do at sqpn.com. So, and you can join them if you want to join in their support for us by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. Uh, let us know what you thought of this Discovery Season 2 premiere uh, titled Brother. You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com slash trek or the SQPN Facebook page and leave us some feedback there or send us an email to trek at sqpn.com. You can find links relevant to our discussion on our show notes at sqpn.com. And we'll be back next week when we'll be discussing the second episode of the season titled New Eden. Hmm, I wonder what that's about. Heading out to New Eden, <laughs> yay, brother. Oh, flashbacks. Until then, <laughs> Father Corey Stiga, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Well, thank you, Dom. And Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thank you, and live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. <laughs>